All right. We're back. <clears throat> All right. Let's see what we're doing here. So we've got a problem set and we have some videos to do. All right. Let me get this open. This is the chapter five problem set, which involves elasticities. And uh, so hold on one second. <laughs> Oh, you know what that reminds me? I put this, I made a note to myself for this very specific reason. Um, for whatever reason, um, the school is closed next Tuesday. Did you all know that? Um, it's on, yeah, I, ha I have their calendar here somewhere. And apparently they decided that because we're not getting a spring break, that we deserve a day off here and there. And so, um, well, let's see if I can find it again. All right, you know what, let, let's go to the, um, the website. I wanna make sure I'm not imagining things. Um, let's see, where could I find this? Okay, this is it. So March the 9th. See, oh, now it doesn't say it here. Where did I get that information? This might be outdated. Um, Jesus. Hold on one second. Let's try this now. Um, oh, here we go. Somebody knows. Good. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. I wasn't, I think they changed. That was done at the last minute. That is not normally the case. Normally um, next week would have been spring break. I think that's why they're doing this. Um, I remember the Manhattanville usually has their spring break fairly early. And so um, it is the ninth. All right, well, that's good to know because obviously we meet on Tuesdays and therefore um, we, it's a good thing we knew that uh, before we showed up for a class that won't happen. So uh, let's, let me just look and see if they've got it listed here. No, see, it doesn't say anything about it here. But I, I must've seen it somewhere because I wrote it down and so I have to, have to assume that these are outdated, these documents. I, I don't know where to look for it. God, um, where would it be on the website? <laughs> so they sent, the school sent you an email reminding you that there's no class on Tuesday. When did you get that email? I don't remember seeing that. All right, I'll tell you what, I'll look at my email and see what they have to say for themselves. kind of weird, but there it is. So I just want to make sure that I wasn't imagining things. Oh, okay. So, all right. Okay. Well, let, I'll worry about it later. I'm, I guess that means that wherever I saw it, it was, it was accurate and correct. So, all right. So let's just point out right now. In fact, I should probably make an announcement anyway. <clears throat> let me go into Blackboard right now. Because not necessarily everybody is here today. So uh, I'll go into uh, Blackboard just to make sure that there's no misunderstandings. And I'll post that right now before I forget all about it, which could happen. <clears throat> I almost forgot about it today. I went out of my way to make a note to myself and I only just noticed it again by accident. <clears throat> all right, so here we go. No, um, Econ 1001, no class on Tuesday, March the 9th for Valiance Day. All right, I think that'll do it.
as a reminder, we will not meet again on Tuesday, um, May 9th, but uh, March 9th, but normal classes will, but we'll be back to, I guess we will certainly meet at our usual time on Friday, um, the 12th, because in other words, I don't want anyone to think that this is spring break or something. All right, that should do it. Nobody, I don't think anyone could misinterpret that. All right, well, that's done. Yeah, I was, I was really trying to make sure I didn't forget about that. So that means that whatever we do today, we, I won't see you again until the following Friday. All right, that's all there is to it. All right, very good. So in the meantime, let's take a look at these problems from chapter five, which are all about elasticity. And so it's really just math more than anything else. All right, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, that's right. Today's the fifth. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We start out by asking uh, you to calculate in each case whether or not the demand is elastic, unilastic, or inelastic. Now, you still have to do the calculations. Uh, there's no other way of figuring this out. So it's basically might as well just say what are the elasticities, but um, you also are asked to uh, classify the result as either unit elastic, elastic, or inelastic. Now, the way this works is that we're assuming that there's two prices and two quantities. So initially, the gas was selling for 425. And the price went up to 450. At the same time, though, the quantity as a result goes from 100 million. Now, when you have a million, hundreds of millions like this, you can just leave it as 100 or 90. Um, including all those extra zeros will not actually affect the results. So you may as well just leave it as 100 and think of it as 100 million. Okay, so now remember how this works. Um, the formula officially is the percentage change in Q divided by the percentage change in P. But remember, if we do it like this, we have an issue where the elasticity will be different depending on which of these is the first point and which of these is the second point. So in order to get around that little problem, we're gonna use the following definition of elasticity, which by the way, let me just make this more clear here. It's the price elasticity of demand that we're looking at here. Okay, so this is the formula that we can use to get rid of that problem we had before, where, like I said, the value you get will be different depending on which point is number one and which point is number two. So how do we get around that issue? We replace Q1 in the denominator here with the average of Q1 and Q2, and then we had to do the same thing for P. Now that's kind of an awkward uh, 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 expression. So what we're gonna do here is write it a little bit differently, which I think, this is my opinion, makes it a little bit easier to deal with. We're gonna multiply by the inverse of this denominator, which means that here, you'll be multiplying by that ratio, and then here you'll do, uh, divide by P2 minus P1. It's up to you. You don't have to do it that way. I, I think it's a little bit quicker and easier. The other thing we should probably do is um, probably break it up into pieces and calculate each piece separately. In other words, um, what I'm proposing to do is write out all four of these terms and then combine them at the end. So for example, Q2 minus Q1 is 
Okay, 90 minus 100. Q2 plus Q1 over 2 is 90 plus 100 over 2, which is 95. Now P2, okay, here we go. P2 plus P1 over 2. The prices are 450 and 4 and a quarter. over two, which is 4.375, halfway between. And then finally, we need the difference between the two prices, P2 minus P1, which is 450 minus 425, which is 25 cents. All right, so we've got all four components of this formula. And well, now I'd like to plug them in here uh, let's see. So I'll, I'll just rewrite this down below because I'm running out of space. All right, and now it's just a question of copying everything we just did. Um, so for example, uh, let's see, I, I, <laughs> it's always a challenge to get everything together on the same page here. Uh, let's do this. Okay, that's better. I can split the screen in half like you see, and that makes things a little easier. So anyway, so the difference between the two Qs is, you, oh, that was minus 10. Down here, the average of the two Qs was 95. The average of the two Ps is 4.375. And the difference between the two Ps is 25 cents. Okay, now that's still a bit of a mess, but we can do it. So if you plug that into your calculator, <clears throat> Let's see, what you should get is in the numerator, minus 43.75. In the denominator, you should have 23.75. <clears throat> and that ratio is negative 1.84. All right, so that's the final result of all of that. All right, it's a bit of a mess. So that's why I think what you should probably do is first start by rewriting it like this. And then calculating each of the four components separately, plugging them in and then doing some algebra. And that's it. Now it's negative 184. Now you remember that with price elasticities of demand, what we normally do is we essentially ignore the sign. So without the sign, the price elasticity of demand is 1.84. Now the classification scheme that we used is this. If the price elasticity of demand is less than one, then the demand for the good is inelastic. Okay, just a quick reminder, if the price elasticity of the um, demand equals one, then the demand for the good is what we will call unit elastic. And then finally, if the price elasticity of demand 
is greater than one, then the demand for the good is elastic. So in this case, since the price elasticity of demand is 184, the demand is elastic. Okay, and again, we're, we're overlooking the sign. Forget the sign. 1.84 means that it's elastic. Of course, in English, that's just another way of saying this means that consumers are very sensitive, or consumers of this good are very sensitive to price changes. Okay, so that means if, let's say this good was put on sale, I forgot what it is already. Um, oh, this is gas, yeah. Um, see, what they're basically saying here is that when the price goes up, um, in this example at least, we buy a lot less. Although in practice, you probably wouldn't see that with gas, but if the elasticity is 184, that means consumers are very sensitive to price changes. All right, now here's the, in the second case, we have newspapers. Now, the problem is exactly the same as the previous one. They're just different numbers. Okay, so the setup is the same and the conclusions are the same. All right, so we'll just start again with this one. Now here, the price is initially a dollar and it drops to 75 cents. The quantity, again, you see how it's in millions, just leave it as 50 and 60. All right, so now remember the formula and there's no point in rederiving it. I'll just write it out directly. In other words, if you want to, you could use this version of the formula. Use the average of the Qs over the difference of the Qs and then multiply. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, I got it backwards, didn't I? Yes, let me, let me just copy this one. Yeah, I did exactly that. I got it, I wrote it backwards. Let me fix it. Hold on one second. Okay, let's try that again. P, Q2 minus Q1 over the average of the two. Now here we're gonna multiply this by the average of the prices uh, over two rather. And then in the denominator, we'll have the difference. And over here, we can calculate these step-by-step. Step. Uh, Q2 minus Q1 is 60 minus 50, which is of course 10. The average of these two is 60 plus 50 over two, which is 55. The difference between the prices is 75 minus a dollar And then the average of these two is uh, 0 0.875. All right, so the elasticity therefore is, or I should say the price elasticity of demand Equals, all right, now we start plugging some numbers in. All right, hold on one second. All right, let me just try to find room for it. Um, yeah, I think I can just about squeeze it in here. Uh, 10 over 55 times of eight set point eight seven five over negative point two five. All right, so the numerator is eight point seventy five. The denominator <clears throat> is negative thirteen seventy five. And so the ratio there 
is negative 0 0.64. All right, now, of course, they've asked us to define whether or not, or describe whether or not this is elastic, inelastic, or unit elastic. And so th in this case, <clears throat> the demand for this product is el inelastic, okay? Because without the sign, 0.64 is less than one. And that basically translates into the idea that people are not very sensitive. Uh, well, let, let's say consumers of this good, let's put it this way. Consumers of this good are not very sensitive to price changes. Okay, so that's what it actually means. All right, and then we have one more. All right, did everyone get that? If not, go back and double check. You could have made a mistake. There's so many opportunities to make mistakes here. That's the problem with this formula. It's kind of a mess, but um, you know, once you get used to it and do it a few times, you should be okay. Nice, all right. Now, how about this one, cruise lines. Uh, let's say the price of a cruise drops from 2000 to 1700. The quantity demand arises from 1 million to 2 million. So again, you can ignore the millions. Uh, let's do this. Uh, we have the first price is 2000. The second price is 1700. The first quantity is one, 1 million, but one, and this is two. All right, so this is our formula. Okay, let me make it a little neater. All right, there we go. So then in the denominator, we have P2 minus P1. All right, we may as well calculate these all one at a time. Two minus one is one. <clears throat> now the average between the two of these is, um, 1.5 and then for the prices we have p2 minus p1 and then the average between the two of them 1700 plus 2000 over 2 is 1850 All right, now we just plug those numbers in. Um, like, I guess we have room over here. So we'll have one over 1.5. Over here we have 1850 over three, negative 300. So we'll have 1850 over negative 450 you can see already, this is going to be a very elastic number. Negative 4.11. That's pretty high. But remember, the threshold is just one. Anything above one, in absolute terms, means that the demand is elastic. All right, so since 4.11 is greater than one, the demand for this product is elastic. Consumers are very sensitive to price changes.
Okay, so we got um, that's it for these. Just scroll it up a little in case you still need to catch up. <clears throat> Okay. All right. So let's see what's coming up next. Less time consuming problems. That's for sure. All right. Now, how about these? In each of the following cases, what will be the impact on total revenue? All right. So here's what's going on. The price elasticity of demand for a good is 0.5 and the firm raises the price by 10%. So what you can do here is and you can memorize this, but what you can do is think about it this way. With the price elasticity of demand of 0 0.5, this means that if the price rises by 10%, the quantity demanded will fall by, and you can multiply these together to come out with 5%. So it stands to reason that since the increase in price is greater than the decrease in quantity demanded, the total revenue will increase. Okay, now if you really want to, you can make up an example. Um, say for example, the price is 10 and the quantity is 100, which means that the total revenue is 1,000. If the price rises by 10% and the quantity demanded falls by 5%, then the new price and quantity are, Okay, so what's happened here is that the new price is 11 and the new quantity is 95. So the total revenue is whatever that is, 11 times 95, 1045. So um, actually, you know, let me do this. If you're wondering where that 11 came from, it's 10 times one plus point n and here it's the original 100 times one minus 0 0.05 okay so this is how you would calculate the change <clears throat> so then the idea here is that rather than trying to um, remember or memorize what happens, what you can try to do is reason it out uh, in order to get the answer. You can still memorize this. I mean, you can. there's a chart in our slides which shows you the impact of changes in prices due to uh, different levels of elasticity. In fact, let's go find it. Just have to quickly look for it. Oh, not here. Oh, I know. What am I doing? It's in chapter five. What's going on over here? It's five. Yeah, I know for a fact that somewhere in here I put a chart. I, or I'm pretty sure. Here it is. Oh, no, that's just for classifications. Here it is. This is what I was referring to. So if you have this chart right in front of you, you could say, oh, well, you know what? Um, all I have to do is look at this uh, question again. And it says here, I've got an inelastic demand in this column, or this row rather. And I'm told that the price went up. So therefore you already knew from this chart that the price increases. But you can also figure it out from pure logic. Okay, just think about what's going on here. Now, I'm not going to tell you you have to do it this way, but um, it's kind of nice. It helps increase your understanding, that's for sure. 
All right, anyway, for B, the price elasticity of demand is 1.2 and the price drops by 10%, okay? So with the price elasticity of demand of 1.2, this means that if the price falls by 10%, the um, quantity demanded will rise by 1.2 times 10%, which is 12%. And so since the increase in quantity demanded is greater than the decrease in price, total revenue will increase again. Okay, and again, if you want to try an example, if P equals 10, Q equals 100, TR equals PQ equals uh, 1,000, then what happens here is that the new price will be 100 times, uh, sorry, 10 times one minus the 10% decline is nine the quantity will be 100 times one plus 12%, which is 112. And the new total revenue will be nine times 112. And that's equal to <clears throat> 1,008. So that just confirms what we we're saying here, that if you cut the price when the elasticity is very high, you're going to make more money. You'll bring more money in. And so goods like this are often put on sale for that reason. All right, one more. Now, this is the uh, interesting case. This is the case of price, a uh, unit price elasticity. So in this case, since the price elasticity of demand is one, the demand for this good is unit elastic. This means that total revenues will not change when the price changes. In other words, um, the change in price will be exactly offset by the change in quantity demanded. So the bottom line is total revenues, therefore, when the price fall or rises 10%, there is no change in total revenues. Okay, so that's a bizarre case. Um, just remember that one is a special case. Um, the other way to think about it though, is that um, here, a price increase of 10% would be to a quantity demand, a reduction in quantity demanded of 10%, which is why total revenue would not be affected. And that's all you would need. All right, now this one is pretty straightforward. How would a good be classified if the income elasticity of demand is, and then we have three of them. So just a quick reminder here, um, as far as income elasticity of demand is concerned, the categories, let me just jump ahead and show them to you again. The categories are a little bit different. We're mainly interested in the signs, but um, you can see that within the positives, we have uh, two subclassifications, I guess you could call them. So we have, in the first case, since the income elasticity of demand is negative, this is an inferior good. Now B, since the income elasticity of demand is positive, this is a normal good, but we can go one step further since the 
um, income elasticity is less than one, it is also considered to be a necessity, okay? No, this one, we don't ignore it. Only with the price elasticity of demand. That's the only time. With the others, we have to keep track of the sign. And also the uh, with supply, the price elasticity of supply, as you recall, is always positive. So the only elasticity where we ignore the sign is price elasticity of demand. For these, uh, all the others, income, elasticity, cross elasticity, um, and supply as well, we are paying attention to the sign. Very good question. So anyway, this is a normal good, but you can also define it as a necessity. In other words, it's the kind of thing you buy all the time. Um, you're not going to be too um, sensitive to changes in the price. Let's say this is um, coffee, okay? You, you buy a certain amount of coffee every week, and if the price goes up a little, you're not really going to pay that much attention to it. So we think of that as a necessity because we consume it on a regular basis. But then in C, since the income elasticity of, de of demand is positive, this is a normal good. But since the income elasticity of demand is greater than one, it is also considered to be a luxury. Ooh, a luxury. This is the kind of thing you only get to have once in a while. It's kind of like um, going to an, ex maybe think about it as going to an expensive restaurant. Once in a while, you want to do it. I mean, some, you know, you can eat out without spending a fortune in a lot of places, but once in a while, you want to have that really nice experience where the food is fancy and you get dressed up and it's expensive and all, but you can't really afford to do that very often. So that would be defined as a luxury. The more income you have, the more likely you are to go to fancy restaurants. Okay, so now here we're looking at the cross elasticity of demand. Now this one is potentially very confusing. I have a chart for this one too. If you get confused, what you have to do is think of an example. That's to me the best way to think about this. So let's just quickly review what this means. Um, we could have potentially substitutes. Coke and Pepsi, the classic example. If the price of Pepsi rises, the demand for Coke will rise and vice versa. So you can see both are going in the same direction. In other words, um, the price of the substitute good rises. And as a result, um, consumers buy more of the Coke. Therefore, uh, cross price, uh, the cross elasticity of demand must be positive. Okay, so by thinking about it that way, Um, positive would imply substitutes because if you, the price of one goes up, you buy more of the other. But for complements, um, hamburgers and fries are actually not. All right, yeah, let's do hamburgers and fries. Okay, we we were doing ketchup, but that's okay. Um, if the price, let's say the potato crop fails, and potato prices increase, the price of the fries will rise and people will buy fewer hamburgers as a result, even though their price hasn't changed. Okay, so think about it this way. So to summarize that, when the price of a complementary good rises, um, the demand for the, bur the burgers falls and vice versa.
Therefore, for subs for compliments, the cross elasticity of demand must be negative. Okay, so again, it's in that chart. I mean, you don't have to go through all this analysis if you don't want to, but I just think it's helpful if you understand the logic. And of course, the third possibility is for unrelated goods. If um, let's say there is a change in the price of fries, again, there is no impact on the demand for, let's say, um, I don't know, you would never eat fries with, um, I don't know, let's think of something. Fries go with everything, don't they? This is not, this is a hard example for me to think of. Um, spaghetti. You wouldn't normally eat fries with spaghetti, would you? No, that, that seems kind of weird. So um, this it means that <laughs> fries and spaghetti are unrelated. The cross elasticity of demand is uh, zero. I guess if you're really desperate and you're hungry enough, you could throw fries onto your spaghetti, but I mean, let's say you would not normally do that unless there's an incredibly good reason for it. Um, I'm sure they're edible, but I mean, I, that doesn't seem like a good combination. So anyway, with all that being said, um, so for negative 0.7, based on this logic, these must be complements, okay? Because it's negative 7, 0.7 rather. So these are complements. Here we have, we can say that these are unrelated. And down here, we can say that these are substitutes. And it's just because of the sign. That's all we need to know. All right, so yes, that's done. Now we didn't necessarily have to go through all of those uh, steps, but this way you'll be able to, any problem that comes along will be just like these. There isn't really anything else we can do with this uh, analysis. So uh, we're done with this. And of course, I will post the solutions on Blackboard later on. Okay, uh, what's going on here? I'm trying to insert page numbers and it's just saying, no, I don't feel like doing that. What the hell is going on here? It's just refusing to obey my instructions. Look at that. Oh. It's very rare that word refuses to obey me. But look at this. It's just, no, I don't want to do it. All right, I'll tell you, let me, let me just turn it off and turn it back on again. Usually when something is being stubborn with you like that, um, the best thing to do is to just show it who's boss. Um, <laughs> you just have to uh, reboot or do whatever. Um, No, something's wrong with it. This happens to Word more, I find, than any of the other uh, Microsoft products. Word, there's something about Word. It just gets into these moods where it doesn't want to do what you tell it. And it just says, no, I, I don't think I am going to work for you today. Let me see if that was the problem. No? Wow, I have to admit, I've never seen that before. It's just point blank refusing to do what I tell it. I don't know what to do about it. That's unbelievable. Well, I guess we'll have to do without the page numbers then. It just won't work. It'll do anything else I ask. Oh, look at that. It's not doing pictures. Huh. All right. That that's, you know, that means probably I have to reboot the computer. It's getting when you, if you don't turn your computer off every so often, it gets like this, uh, where the software refuses to cooperate with you. Uh, later on, I'll just reboot it and I'll get those page numbers in there. Um, we don't have time to play games with it. Anyway, 
So in the meantime, now we've got a few videos that I'd like you to see. These are based on chapter seven. We already looked at one of them where we were looking at how to calculate consumer and producer surplus in the presence of, uh, I think it was a price floor. Let me just, let's go double check. Let's see if it'll allow me to open it. Oh, these are Word documents. Let's see if it'll allow me to do this. There we go. So we got a few more I want to look at. One of them is how to calculate consumer and producer surplus with a floor. And then we've got a discussion about what happens with taxes and dead weight loss. Uh, that's, that's what our next discussion was going to be. Um, we've already looked at changes in um, consumer and producer surplus as a result of price ceilings and floors, but we also have to consider how the impact of a tax on, on a market. The, what's interesting about taxes is that some, you know, between the consumer and the producer, the total is going to be paid by the two of them. And often the two of them will actually end up splitting the tax. Each will pay some of it. Neither side typically pays the entire amount. So we're going to see how that works uh, when we get to this, these last two videos. But right now, let's look at this one about how to calculate consumer and producer surplus with the price floor. Now, this one, it's not that terribly exciting. He's literally just going to show you the graph, go through the math, and when you're done, you'll see how it works. The next two will be much more interesting. Um, they'll discuss it in more detail. This one, it's literally just watch him color in the, you know, the consumer and producer surplus and see how they change when there's a price floor. All right, so let me pop this into the chat box. And we'll watch this now. And let's take it away. With ISL, not only does Charlie get extra
All right, I guess everyone's done watching it. So yeah, that was a good review of consumer producer surplus. You know, just, just to get the practice with a geometry, which is really what it is. So those are fairly straightforward. You just have to visualize where um, the new price line is after the government has imposed a price floor or possibly a price ceiling and then figure out what the new quantity is and then uh, fill in the, the appropriate shapes. And of course, whenever something like that happens, there's always going to be some dead weight loss because the government is basically interfering with consumers' choices. Oh, what? no, there's no quiz. Um, we're just gonna have problem sets. And then at some point we'll have what I call my sample midterm. And then when we're done with that, we'll have um, the actual midterm, which is on a take home basis. All right, so the, yeah, there's not gonna be any kind of like online test that's done in real time. Um, we'll figure this out next week, but we're getting close to the point where we've covered enough material that we can even think about a midterm. So, but before we do that, um, in fact, I may have it here somewhere, the sample midterm, which I don't think I've posted yet. Um, it's a little early for that, but uh, when we do have it, you'll see that um, it is itself just a bunch of questions from what we've been doing. And so you can see there's 15 fill-ins and then there's problems and uh, it's essentially a review of what we've been doing. So we'll go through that before we have the actual midterm. But when you do have the midterm, you'll you'll download it. Oh, I did, oh, good, okay. So, uh, but of course we don't have time to look at it now. In fact, I'm glad you brought this up. I'll tell you what, since we are off on Tuesday, why don't we do this? Why don't we agree to go over it on Friday. You'll have plenty of time to work on it. And now that we're completely done with chapters uh, three, four, and five, and the problem sets that went with them, yeah, you know what? I think you're right. I think it's time to get going on that. Um, not that we're in a real rush. You know, the, we still have a long way to go in this semester, but there's no point in um, delaying either. So I'll tell you what. The first three chapters do represent the first midterm. And um, we're now done covering these chapters and we're done with the problem sets. So the last hurdle would be to go over that sample midterm. And when that's done, I'll just post the actual midterm. And if I post it on a Friday, you could have until not that Monday, but the week after to get it done, which is more than enough time because the midterm itself was designed to be given out in a classroom setting where we only had an hour and 15 minutes. So the actual midterm is relatively short. It's just a question of, you know, obviously understanding all the concepts. And, you know, in some cases you will be asked to draw graphs. And so um, what I usually had people do in the past was things that could be drawn or had to be drawn uh, you could include it in your test and then take pictures of everything. Or some people, what they would do is they would type up one part of the test and then they would only take pictures of, the, uh, of their graphs. It doesn't matter either way. Your, the phone cameras these days are so good, you should have no trouble taking pictures of your work and sending it back to me. And so, but we'll discuss all that next Friday. Okay, but in the meantime, why don't you download the sample midterm and then we'll go over it next Friday and then I'll post the actual test. And, and by having a week to do it like that, a week plus, you'll have plenty of opportunities to ask questions if you're not sure about something. You can ask them during the class or you can send me emails if you're unclear about what you're supposed to do with the test. But I think you'll find it to be extremely straightforward. It's just exactly what we've been doing. All right, and then you can get that out of the way. <laughs> Stop worrying about it because uh, I, I think that you may have already started having midterms in your other classes. Is that about the size of it? Or is this your first one? No, okay. Um, all right, well, I was just wondering, um, not yet, uh, it's about time. Now, the thing is though, this class has two midterms though. So we really have to maybe get rolling a little earlier than other classes where if you may have just the one midterm and the one final. So um, but that's all right. It shouldn't interfere with something else. Um, you know, what would happen in the past is, especially in the classroom setting is I would give out a midterm and people would say, you know, we got three others this week. Uh, I, I don't think that would be an issue this time. 
All right. Well, with all that being said, why don't we do this? Now we're going to, the next one is about taxes. Now taxes are different because instead of imposing a limit on the price that we can charge, uh, a tax actually affects either the supply or the demand curve. So this is a somewhat different situation than what we've been looking at up to this point. But even here, we can use the concepts of consumer surplus and consumer uh, producer surplus, as well as dead weight loss to analyze the impact of the tax. Ultimately, what we wanna know is who ends up paying for it, who benefits, who loses, and is there any dead weight loss? All right, so let's take a look at this one. Let's see, uh, here we go. Well, let's check this out. <clears throat> okay. All right, very good.
All right, are we all done? Excellent. All right. Now we're going to have to revisit these topics again. Obviously, first of all, we're off on uh, Tuesday and then we have to go through the sample midterms. So by the time we get back to this topic, we may have to review again. But I thought that was very well done, especially the way he explained how dead weight loss works. And I love that analogy at the end. I mean, that tax that they impose on yachts. You imagine people in Congress saying, woo, we're going to raise all this money and those evil rich people. And before you know it, they end up having to pay more in unemployment benefits than they brought in in taxes. So a completely boneheaded move. You'd think that they would learn from their mistakes, but this kind of thing happens over and over and over again. All right. But anyway, in the meantime, uh, I think it's time to go. But just don't forget, we're first of all, no class on Tuesday. And secondly, when I see you on Friday, uh, I think it's high time that we go over the sample midterm so we can get that first midterm out of the way. All right. So if there's no last minute questions, I'll see you then. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Okay. You too. Thank you, Professor. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you. See you later.